Ward 12 Councillor Forum. Um, thanks for showing it, your, your strong interest in, in uh, civic issues and the issues that shape Calgary. My name is Mac Hickley. I'll be your moderator tonight. <coughs> Working with me are Cheryl Johnson on the timer and Jeremy Zhao, who will be helping collect your questions to be asked later in the, in the forum. And uh, I'm going to speak for a little bit too long at the start of this show, so please bear with me. This is important, and I just want to run through it quickly. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Civic Camp, Civic Camp is a nonpartisan public advocacy group enabling citizens to engage in creating a city that works for us all. For any Calgarian who is welcome to become a Civic Camper by visiting civiccamp.org, and learning more about the organization, what values civic campers have set out for themselves, and join up with a group that interests them. One of those groups is the Election Initiatives Group. This group decided that one of the best ways they could raise public awareness and civic issues during the election was to ensure a forum is held in each ward, something that in 2010, we became the first group in Calgary to do. Now, a few thanks are in order. Civic Camp volunteers have donated a lot of time and effort in putting these shows together. And uh, we wouldn't be here if, uh, if those volunteers hadn't, hadn't stepped forward. We also couldn't have done it without a few sponsors who generously donated their time and services as well. Some of them are listed here. Uh, I'd like to first thank our host tonight, Cardell Theatre, for uh, giving us this fantastic facility. I'd also like to thank Calgary Sound Rentals and the Calgary Roadrunners for providing the sound and the timing equipment that we're using tonight. I'd like to thank our media partners, CBC Calgary, CJSW, Fast Forward Weekly, and Metro Calgary for uh, helping get the word out about the, these uh, series of forums. And uh, thanks to the Calgary Association of Parents and School Councils and the Alberta Teachers Association for their support of our school board trustee citizens forums, as well as the Students Association of Mount Royal University who are hosting our Ward 11 citizens forum and the University of Calgary Students Union who are hosting our Ward 1 and Mayoral Citizens Forums. Also, the Calgary Foundation has helped us pay a few bills that we, uh, a few bills that we did acquire over the course of this. And finally, uh, a big thanks to every candidate in Ward 12 for showing up, and for all of you for coming out to hear them. Now, for tonight, there's a tricky format that I'd like to go through with you. We've, uh, civic campers have called these forums citizens forums because the questions, for most of it, have come from Calgarians, from Calgarian citizens, through uh, the Civic Camp uh, website. So Civic Camp asked Calgarians what questions they'd like to ask these uh, candidates at these forums, and probably over 100 questions so far have been asked and voted on, and we'll be running through those questions tonight. The top vote-getting questions uh, are, is where we're going to start. Now, each candidate, both candidates, will be asked some questions and given two minutes to respond. And they also have, just excuse me for a moment. Thanks for that. This is uh, just had a, it's a slight medical yeah. thing. Nosebleed, to be honest. <laughs> He's got a nosebleed and it's just came up before. Um, so I'm Peter. I'm one of the co-organizers for Civic Camp. I'm just going to step in here for a few minutes. Um, so pardon me if I bear, I haven't read this script in a, a couple of weeks. So sorry, Max just stepping into the washroom for one sec. Apologize. Um, so as Mac referenced, we're going to be using a format. Um, he was talking about the poker chips. So these chips, the candidates have in front of them, I believe how many, you've each been given five poker chips. So the poker chips are the random part of the draw. Um, these are opportunities for, I believe, one minute rebuttals. Have we, one minute rebuttals, so sorry. For the candidates to jump in at any time on one question. Um, they can also use more than one of these at any occasion. So if they want to have a second minute after their their uh, fellow candidate has responded, they can have an additional bit of time. However, they are only afforded five of these chips for the entire duration of our forum. So once they're gone, they have been used up. Um, we, and when the candidates do put them forward, we will call an order of the ants, uh, call them in order. So in this case, there's two candidates, but if we had more than two, we would call them in order. 
Um, so the next part is it, we're also asking the public to ensure we have some more ward specific questions. Everyone here in the audience has been provided cards. If you don't have any, uh, Jeremy Zhao, uh, my co-coordinator here with the uh, Forums Initiative, uh, he will have those cards and you can write down on those cards with the pencil award specific question. So these are ideas that we'd like to hear, not just about for all the city council, but something that's specific to Ward 12. It could be uh, an issue in your community, an issue in the ward that's pertinent to your where you live in Ward 12. So those are available there and we will take those questions up until the end of the first half before the intermission and we'll include some of those questions in the second half after the intermission. Um, please keep your questions succinct and to the point and ward specific. If, it's, if it takes two or three cards to write, you probably want to look at shortening it up a little bit. Um, we have some uh, ground rules. Just to let everybody know, respect the clock. We have a timer here to help. So Cheryl is our, our wonderful support person for this event. Um, there is a timer there and we're going to ask the candidates to respect those, uh, those timings when we have the response times. Uh, also, we're going to make it, uh, make it easy for the audience to listen, so we're going to have, obviously have candidates to respect each other when they're speaking and wait for the other to finish. Uh, we're hoping to stay issues focused, so this is a forum, not a debate. We're gonna, uh, we want to hear ideas. Um, we're going to look to avoid personal references and criticism directed at uh, fellow candidates, and we're going to stay issues focused. Um, We'd like the supporters to have signs outside. I don't see any in here. Um, so just any additional campaign signage or things of that nature, we've asked all people to leave that in the lobby and have this to be a, uh, as high of a nonpartisan uh, place as we can. Um, and please don't interrupt the speakers uh, when they're speaking. We can save uh, those types of comments and things for the intermission, but please don't interrupt our speakers today. Um, so introductions, I'd like to introduce uh, our candidates, we'll let the candidates introduce themselves actually, and we'll give them three minutes each to tell us a little about themselves. And uh, we'll do this by starting from the audience's left with Stephanie. You have three minutes there. Thank you. Uh, how's everyone doing this evening? Good, good stuff. First of all, I'd like to ask how many of you out there are Ward 12 undecided voters. How many of you do not know how you're going to vote October 21st? Okay, okay, so I'm seeing a, a few out there, may, maybe about 10. All right, that's good for me to know. Well, my name is Stephanie Cousy, and first of all, I would like to thank everyone. First of all, I would like to thank, um, I would like to thank Civic Camp for putting on this forum. I think it's absolutely fantastic that they create this venue where you, the ward residents, can come out and meet the candidates. Second of all, I would like to thank uh, Cardell for providing this uh, fantastic facility in which we can have um, this forum. Third, I'd like to thank Shane. Shane, thanks for coming out. It would be pretty boring if you weren't here this evening. So, so glad to see you're here. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you in the audience for being here this evening. In this day and age, I know how busy your lives are, and I really appreciate you taking an evening out of your hectic schedules uh, to come and hear what we have to say. What I'm really excited about with this forum is that this forum, as Peter indicated, is about ideas. But the truth is, ideas can be meaningless if there are no, is no action and there are no results. And I think that Ward 12 deserves better action and better results. And that's why I have put my name forward as city councillor for Ward 12. How am I going to achieve these results? I will achieve these results with better collaboration. Better collaboration with city council members, better collaboration with all levels of government. I will also achieve these results through applying my skills and my experience. Experience that I have had as a representative for Canada abroad, advancing Canada's interests. Experience that I have had as a senior advisor to the highest political leaders in the land. And experience that I have had as a financial manager responsible for multi-million dollar budgets. So War 12, I look forward to hearing about your ideas tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, so, Shane, uh, you have three minutes, and feel free to introduce yourself. 
Well, thank you very much, and thank you for everyone coming, and I think Stephanie has thanked everyone for us, so I won't go through that again. Um, I will do, I will introduce myself, though uh, I won't get into debate about uh, who is the best candidate at this time, but um, I'm married, I have uh, six children, uh, eight grandchildren, and I even have a son who owns a business in Ward 12, so I'm directly related to the benefit of Ward 12. Um, I've received my Bachelor of Education from the University of Regina with my Master's of Administration uh, from the University of Calgary. I moved into Ward 12 in uh, 1997, so I've been here for 16 years, and I, I know and I understand the needs and the changing dynamics of this ward without question. And when I moved here, if you can imagine, we had stoplights on the Deerfoot. It's been that long, and I've been involved in this community ever since. My community experience is uh, I'm a school administrator in Mackenzie Lake. Um, I was treasurer and president and still active in a community association. I was a community advisory board member uh, with Seekers, which is the Southeast Rec Centre, which is now looking at the, the nice development of our two rec centres, which construction will start next week. Um, I was an advisory on the NMAX power station that's going out in there, the community advisory board. I was involved in the South Shepherd Area Structures Plan, which was directly related to how we're developing as a community and as a city. Um, and before that, uh, all that before being elected in 2010 as your ward alderman. I was also a founder of a, a nonprofit organization called FIRM, which is Families in Remembrance of Military Members. And of course, that's in honor of my nephew, Shane Keating, who was killed in Afghanistan. Um, all my community involvement here has been Ward 12 specifically related for the last 16 years, as well as as a very active on the city of Calgary as your representative for the last three years. And the committees I've sat on and chaired and vice chaired are uh, Community and Protective Services Vice Chair, uh, Transportation Community uh, and Transportation and Transit, sorry, Land and Asset Strategy Committee, Audit Committee, Aldermanic Office Coordinating Committee, Governance re Review of how City Council operates, Vice Chair, Police Commission, Silver Era for Seniors, a board member on behalf of the City of Calgary, Task Force and Special Audit for Access Calgary, Chair. And so I've looked at it, so I've gained knowledge over the past 16 years with the plans already in place for quite certainly making your choice tonight very clear on who's the best candidate with plans in place to move forward. Thank you very much for coming. Okay, great. Well, you got to know your candidates a little bit. Now we're going to move to the next portion. We're actually going to get into crowdsource questions. So these are crowdsource questions, and I think Mac mentioned it in the beginning. These are from Calgarians. These have been on a, a open website to the public that Calgarians can all vote on, and that is still live tonight. You can get more information from our, our volunteers about that at the break or afterwards. Um, so the first question is, you did a random draw here. We're going to go first with... Stephanie and then Shane to follow and it's gonna be right here so I'll start off uh, the question is do you support legalization of secondary suites in all existing neighborhoods subject only to reasonable safety concerns why or why not you have two minutes sure well at this point uh, I have knocked on thousands of doors in Ward 12 and this issue does not come up all of the time when I am consulting with Ward 12 residents. However, the individuals who want to discuss it are very polarized, and I definitely can understand both sides of the issue. On one hand, we have individuals um, in the R1 areas, uh, such as Douglasdale, who feel very strongly that implementing a citywide um, secondary suite allowance will deeply affect property values. Uh, other concerns also include enough parking space on streets, and I can certainly understand that as well. And finally, um, with brought to light recently safety, uh, particularly for basement suites. So these are the individuals who feel strongly that these secondary suites should not be allowed. On the other hand, we have individuals who are looking primarily for space, not only for as a rental um, income, but also those who would like to have a spot, a spot, a space in their home for caregivers, both for children and also for the elderly. I talked to one woman in particular, uh, Darlene and Douglas Dale, who felt that she would have liked to have had the option of having somewhere to place 
her dying mother, but could not. So I felt a lot of compassion and a lot of sympathy for her. Uh, but the reality is, I believe, that ultimately um, that the citizens of Calgary should decide that this should be brought to, to a referendum. Um, this is simply something where individuals are just um, too involved, uh, I think too, too committed one way or another. I think as an elected representative, you should always reflect uh, the will of, of the people. And as such, I would really like to see this made a referendum question, Peter. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, two minutes for Shane. Thank you. Um, um, no, I can say on the outset I do not support a blanket. And the, and the emphasis on the word blanket, that means every residence, whether it's duplex, a multiplex, or whatever, could have a secondary suite within it. There are many organizations and there are many uh, subdivisions in this area. When you moved in with the idea that this was going to be this style of living, doesn't mean that you should be forced to change just because there is a need. Now, let's look at what the need is. First of all, the city council has already gone ahead and, and rezoned over 100,000 dwellings in Calgary that could have secondary seats without question. So if the uptake is there, let those go first and then let's move on. I believe very strongly that we should be removing all fees if you want a secondary suite. As it is now, if you don't have zoning for secondary suites, you have to go and apply which is a $5,000 touch. I think that's ridiculous. What you do is you go through the process and you have to come to council for a hearing. And all. If you want a secondary suite, it should be automatic. $50 fee and away you go. So that way you're eliminating all of the roadblocks that are going into secondary suites. The other one is should be, I have no problem doing a blanket rezoning, is saying that secondary suites are discretionary, not permitted. Permitted means you apply and you get it. And that's the difficulty I have with this blanket re redesignation. Permitted means, like I said, you get it, you end of, end of story. Your, your neighborhood, your neighbors right beside you don't really have a say in whether it's useful. Not all properties in, in Calgary are adapt for secondary suites. Many are on cul-de-sacs, many ha do not have off-street parking, all of these things. So discretionary means you apply, there's a process, but it's very cheap and you go forward. Everyone has a say and you evaluate that property whether it should be done or not. All the secondary suite in many cases discriminates is you need a stove in the basement. If you don't have a stove, anyone can live there. There are many ways to accomplish family members and child care without having a stove and you've got your secondary suite. Thank you. All right, thank you, Shane. Okay, so we're gonna move on. Um, we're gonna start this time with uh, uh, Shane Keating. And the question is, uh, with a vacancy rate approaching 0% in Calgary, what long-term action will you take to ensure young professionals and students have a place to live in Calgary? Uh, two minutes. For the last three years, I've stood up and I've talked about efficiencies and I've talked to ways of thinking outside the box in council. I had a motion arising that passed unanimously just last on the very last council member where it says that the city of Calgary has many land holdings that are sitting vacant. So let's get out and let's do a report and let's find private corporations or possibly even the Calgary Housing Authority who could bring in many styles of temporary housing which allow. There are cottages, there's Katrina style housing, there's even container developments where you take old uh, sea cans from, the, from the, the trucks that are delivering them and you develop them into housing and they look extremely attractive. So let's do those on a temporary basis until that land is required for something. Right now it's sitting empty and it's not gaining taxes and the city's maintaining it. So what can we do outside of these blanket ideas? What can we do to make sure that those that need it, whether they're low income or whether they're workers trying to come eat, you know, are here for a short, short time and they need housing, or whether it's families that you know, just can't afford the rents that are in Calgary. So the motion passed unanimously, sorry, unanimously by uh, the council members, uh, showing their support for my concept, showing that I do have a, a working relationship with all council. And the idea, again, is on that land, let's put this temporary housing. It might be for 5, 10, 15 years until the land is actually required for the LRT or for a number of these other uses. It's sitting there idle. So why don't we use it in the interim? Why don't we go forward and get some out-of-the-box thinking? That's just one of the ways. I think we can look at many, many different ways. There's uh, styles now that we're coming in where they're redeveloping uh, warehousing into condo units. And we talk about the lofts and those sorts of things. We can look at those. 
There's styles where you can take an office building now and convert it. We're talking about even taking vacant schools and converting them into housing for seniors or for those that need it. There are many ways of doing it going across the broad base. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Uh, Stephanie, two minutes for this question. Well, I absolutely feel that this has to be addressed um, for two primary reasons. Um, one is that given the flood uh, and the, the impacts of the flood, we will only see this situation worsen in the coming years. So it is absolutely imperative that we do come up with solutions. In addition, I believe that it's very important for the Calgarian economy that we retain young people and that they have places to stay uh, and, and that they are um, not only attracted here, but are able to stay here. I've met uh, several young people door knocking who are actually going back to where uh, they came from um, for this very reason, uh, because they figure why should they continue um, renting here when they can own a home where they're from for, for a far less amount. Um, this is also why I feel it's very important that we come to a conclusion regarding the secondary suite issue. I feel that perhaps um, the, the outcome of that could contribute to the solution of this problem potentially. But more importantly, uh, I believe that I would like to see developers get involved. There is one municipality I can think of in particular in which a developer has chosen to make their next project um, specifically for low-income individuals. I, I really believe that the private sector can provide a number of solutions for us across government. I think that um, private corporations want to be a part of our community. They want to contribute. And this is definitely uh, one way that they can do so and one way that a developer is choosing to do so to make their next development specifically uh, for low-income low income, uh, individuals. And I, I appreciate that um, as an individual who would like to see solutions. And I hope that other corporations and developers will consider how they can come up with solutions as, like, like this as well. Thank you, Peter. Thanks. Thanks. So Shane's indicated he'd like to uh, use one of his chips for one minute of extra time to respond to this question. Thank you, and I think this is a prime example of how Stephanie can get up to speed on what's happening in Calgary as she's new to the neighborhood. Um, we have a number of developers who build low-income housing. They build it on an access where they develop and they actually don't require a down payment. Trico is one example. Calgary Housing Authority, or Accessible Housing, is another one where they actually come in and they come in with $2,000 down and they work over a process of time where they pay down their mortgage and they're able to... Uh, assume this. So there are many private developers who are doing this. There's another building right on Memorial Drive. When you drive into the core, uh, about a five-story, very long building that was built, by, and I forget the developer's name, but they have a non-profit society that does exactly that. They go out and they find out people who may not be able to save enough for a down payment, but they can get into this housing with very low, and over time they're able to develop that and they pay back their down payment over time. And, and so those examples are here and they're used extremely well. All right. All right. If no one else is uh, responding on that one, uh, we're going to move on to question three. Uh, we're going to change gears a little bit. Just uh, I'm going to ask a question now, and it's going to be Stephanie first and followed by Shane. And it's going to be, here's the question, two minutes each. Uh, what would you do to support the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative? And how would your efforts improve that initiative? So you have two minutes, Stephanie. Well, first of all, I would like to say that I greatly support the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative. Um, to quote a great Calgarian, Lucy Miller stated that, Calgary can only be a great city when it's great for everyone. And I, I genuinely believe that from the bottom of my heart. The two ways I feel specifically that I as an elected representative uh, could assist with the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative uh, specifically here in Ward 12 would be first of all to make um, a community here uh, a community hub. I think that's very important to have community hubs as, as central places in support uh, of this initiative. And even more importantly, um, as someone who worked for the, uh, the federal government, I'm a big believer in single points of service. 
and I believe that having a, a single point of service uh, for those individuals who require services um, is a very efficient and effective way uh, to to address to 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 service these people who require these services and to address this. So, I I do support this um, this initiative um, greatly. So. Um, I, I really believe in the motto, enough for all. I would say that uh, you know, this would be the root of all of the problems that I encounter at the door, whether it's not enough roadways or not enough schools, but I genuinely believe that there could be enough for all. And um, that would be how I would support this initiative. Thank you, Peter. All right. Shane, two minutes for the same question. So how would you support the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative? Well, thank you. First, I want to talk about some examples that are happening already. Uh, Calgary Housing Authority and we've, uh, the City Council supports them and gives money to them and what they're actually doing is they're building buildings and they're putting in three levels of support you might say. So they have some at market housing within that building. They have some slightly subsidized uh, rent in that housing and they have some deeply subsidized rent in that housing. So what happens is all three of those work it together so that the building is sustainable by itself. There's no requirement for further subsidies and further input into there. So I think that's where we have to go. We have to get in there and it integrates all levels of socioeconomic backgrounds into one building so you don't get housing which is strictly for a subsidy for low income people. You get this variety of residents that are in there. That's the way we have to go and that's where we're going. I had uh, them come into my office the other day and I said, tell me where you need land and how much you need because as it is, the city of Calgary has vast, vast acres of land that are sitting idle, as I said earlier. So we would dedicate that land, first of all, to this organization. They could mortgage the land, they get their down payment for the building, and they could build their building and move on from there. And I think that's absolutely one of the ways to go. We also look at the number of housing that the city looks after now, and part of it is owned by the federal government, parts owned by the provincial, parts owned by the city, and they're all sort of different levels, and you can't take one person who qualifies for this housing and put it in this style of house because they don't cross the boundaries, and I think that's the second way. Reduce all the boundaries, get rid of the red tape, get rid of the bureaucracy that we find within all levels of government, and move forward so we can go from there. Uh, the board I sit on, Silvera for Seniors, the city subsidizes and gives money to them well over a million and a half dollars or two million dollars on an annual basis. And they do that so that they can support the seniors who need the low income. We have to get into housing which works, which is sustainable and does not require constant uh, donations from any level of government over time, but it fits the bills to those who have low income. Thank you. Okay, uh, that is... Got one more question in this round. Um, we're going to go with blue, which is Shane will go first, a uh, blue chip. And the question is, two minutes each, uh, do you believe that urban sprawl is a problem for the city of Calgary? The second part being, if you believe it is a problem, what will you do or what have you done to address it? I've looked at and I've led the fight to have developers pay their own area structure plan, which is in tune of about a million dollars plus. I don't believe those in private business should be subsidized by the city. I'm also leading the fight where we, technically, the city gets out of the banking business, which means as it is now, the city puts in the very large pipes and the developers tap off of that. They do pay a levy, but whether that levy is sufficient enough or not, I'm saying why should we even be in that business? Let them run their own business. The question of sprawl is interesting, and we use it often in a biased base. So am I against consumer choice? Absolutely not. I do believe, and I've told many developers, I'd love to see a 17-story condo unit in Ward 12 in the right place and pre-planned so that it is there. I've had people come to me and say, I'd love to live in a condo unit, but I don't want to do it downtown. Society engineering is not something that the city of Calgary should ever get into and saying you must live in this style and this is where you should live, whether it's multifamily or in this location. Let's make every location work. Ward 12 is a prime example of what the city of Calgary should look like. We have three employment sites, 30 to 40,000 employees in the next five to 10 years. We will have an LRT. We do have two recreation facilities, finally. It is where you can live, work, and play, and that's what we have to do. You can look at Quarry Park, 15,000 employees, 30% of the employees today live in the area. So the question isn't sprawl, it's sustainability. How do you develop in such a way that that area pays for itself, tax base, and all of that? That's what we should be looking at. The second thing is when we talk about the city of Calgary, it's massive as far as uh, square uh, kilometers. 
but you have to take away all the undeveloped. We have an airport right within our boundaries that nobody counts and says, oh, we've got terrible problems here. Look at what you're talking about, look at the statistics, and actually talk it, to it from a non-biased opinion rather than a philosophical point. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shane. Uh, Stephanie, two minutes on the same question. I don't believe that urban sprawl is, uh, well, I, would, I, I consider urban sprawl to be development, and I'm certainly not against development. Um, when I go to knocking on the doors, um, both the individual at the door and I agree that we both want to live in Ward 12. However, the reality is that at uh, 8.15 in the morning, I will be trying to um, merge right to get onto 24th Street while they're going south on, on the Deerfoot. So the problem that I think that exists right now is that we are not doing smart development, smart <coughs> planning. And I believe that we need to, to give better thought to this, to have better collaboration with all players involved. Because in my experience, in the thousands of doors that I have knocked on, individuals there constantly lament why they are stuck in traffic for two hours a day, that's 40 hours in a month, that's two days of their life uh, a month, when they feel that they would like to spend this time better, spend this time with their families. They wonder why in the morning they have to put one child uh, uh, um, down, the, down the block to school and they have to put another child uh, on a bus for, for 45 minutes. Uh, so I think that what people would like to see is just better planning within, within the communities. Um, this is primarily what I'm hearing at the door is that we all want to be here, but we have to give better consideration to the resources that exist within the ward. People definitely want to see uh, light rail transit. They, this is absolutely the greatest need in Ward 12. But, but where is it? At the beginning of the last election, it was at the top of the transportation priority list. It's moved to the bottom of the priority list. And everyone I talk to at the door is wondering why that is. Um, so they feel the same way um, regarding the recreational facilities. Will they come? Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, so Shane's indicated he'd like another minute on this question. Uh, one minute. I think we also have to look at differentiating the difference between an LRT and a BRT. The LRT in the southeast was always talked about, but when we say it was at the top of the record, it was never there. It was said, it's the next LRT. Now when we get into route ahead is a plan which identifies the southeast LRT to be the first one to go ahead. It's there, it's on the record, read it, it's about this thick, it's even got charts and it's there and it says go ahead. Now, investing on mobility was another aspect of where, how are we going to invest in BRTs? Totally different things, but how are we going to invest in BRTs? And the cost, the value for money proposal that administration came up with was defeated at council not too long ago and said, we're not going there. We have to study this first. There's a difference between a BRT, value for money, the VRT, which is the transit way, was at the bottom because of the cost of a brand new line. It's a hybrid. It's an LRT and a BR combination. You can't confuse the two and you can't say it's at the bottom. Thank you. All right, Stephanie's indicated she would like another minute on this question. One, sure. go Regar ahead. Regardless of what it is, uh, it's not in Southeast Calgary at present. It's not in Ward 12. Residents notice that it's not there and it's also very clear that there is not a clear funding plan in an effort to have this at any time soon with a, a timeline potentially of, of 35 years. Residents are very concerned about this. I think what's required is what I refer to as the three C's. The first C is collaboration. We need to have all of the votes of City Council. That's what you require, not just the three of the South, you need to convince the Central and the North. Secondly, we need to evaluate the criteria better. Cost per passenger, what information are we not looking at that is not allowing us to have access to the funding? People want to know that. And finally, creative solutions. Why aren't we looking more at P3 solutions like Vancouver did for the Canada line, like Ottawa has done most recently with SNC-Lavalin, and Waterloo is also exploring as well. Thank you. All right, thanks for those responses. Um, we are going to take one more question of the crowdsourced uh, questions. Uh, we'll go through that round for both candidates and then we're going to go take an intermission, short intermission. So the last question of this round before the intermission actually is dealing with mobility choices and transportation. So um, we're going to go here uh, with 
uh, red first on the fifth one, so that would be Stephanie first, followed by Sheen. And the question for round five is, how do you think we can create greater mobility choices, including biking, walking, and transit, in addition to cars, in, a, in the city as well as in your ward? Thank you, Peter. Well, I think that this is a very important issue for Ward 12 residents. Um, I hear very frequently when I am door knocking that individuals use the paths uh, that are in place, not only for recreational purposes, but also for commuting purposes as well. And they are very eager to see these paths um, repaired after the flooding um, in short order. So um, it is definitely of importance to to Ward 12 residents. Um, you know, it should be noted that only 2% of commuting occur occurs uh, by bike. However, 80% um, of cars generally only have one passenger within them. So I would like to also see alternatives such as high occupancy lanes um, looking at more or taken into greater consideration. But in terms of how um, we can allow for greater mobility opportunities for Ward 12 residents, I, I do believe that we have a wonderful um, pathway system here. I, I believe it's uh, 15,000 kilometers, which is one of the, the top, if not the top in Canada, allowing Calgarians many opportunities. I think what we need to do is provide them with easier accessibility to these things. What stands out in my mind is um, bike, bike uh, locations at LRT so that individuals can take their bikes to LRTs and, and leave them there and take the LRT as one option, in addition to seeing more bike racks on, on buses and individuals, uh, citizens being able to transport their bikes in this regard. Uh, because as I have stated in, in consultation with people at the doors, uh, they very much value being outside uh, and, and they wish to see uh, more of an effort made in, in this direction to give them more opportunities to, to do these types of things. Thank you, Peter. Okay, great. Shane, two minutes on the same question. Thank you. I think, I think we have to look at first at Ward 12 is, I, I touched on it before, but the whole concept of changing how we develop our communities and where we're going. When we look at 30% of the people who presently work at Quarry Park live in the neighborhood. That's a walk, that's a bike. We have to change the direction in which we're going in our traffic. Rush hour should not always be downtown in one direction and then away from there. It has to be two-dimensional traffic where some are leaving from the north and they're coming to Quarry Park. Some from Quarry Park are going to the north, and we get that into that area. When you live closer to your employment, the, the car is not needed as much. The bikes are there, the walking paths are there, carpooling is there, a short bus ride is there, not an hour plus to get downtown when we think about it. So we have to make sure, and we're doing this in our area structure plans. The north is doing them, and the same, they're, they're putting employment centers embedded into residential areas. And that's the key in many cases to changing mobility and giving the choice. I said at the last uh, council meetings when we had them, when we talked about transportation, there should be a bike lane right beside L every LRT track. So you could go that way. You get a flat tire, you hop on the train, and you go on. There should be a walking path in such a way. The buses should be looping in such a way that they connect to all of the LRTs. We have to get a solid solid service style of transit into the Calgary, which means the spokes come out from the core and then the spokes connect at each end as we go around. You don't have to go to the core and back to get into that sort of type of style. We have to change the style of transportation from a commuter to a service, and we have to look at ways of making sure that those who want to do a different modality have the choice and they have the ability to do it. The bike lane in it right beside the LRT is a great example. Thank you. All right. Well, that concludes the final round of the first half. Uh, we are going to take a short intermission. I just want to let anybody know who's working on a question or who's got something on their mind. We're collecting those questions now for consolidating them for the second half. So if you have any of those cards, please give them to Jeremy here in the front. And uh, we will take a... We're going to shoot for 10 minutes, hopefully not too much more than that. So we're going to be back here at uh, 10 after 8. And uh, thanks, everybody. We'll, we'll see you in a few minutes. Uh, we're back for the second half. I, as moderator, have a certain amount of discretion with these questions, uh, a certain amount of time and not enough of it for everybody. But um, I just wanted to remind or 
note that there's a little bit of courtesy that, that we need to follow when we're asking questions. I can't ask a question to one candidate that's directed at one candidate only. They have to be um, answerable by both of them equally. So there's a couple of questions I'm not going to um, entertain that were submitted. However, I'm looking particularly for ward-specific questions. And when I run out of ward 12 specific questions, I'll go back to citywide type questions, which I also received on the cards. And there's more of those in the, in the crowdsourced questions as well. So to start, I'll randomly select one of the candidates to go first, red. Stephanie goes first. How do you see the roles of community associations and resident associations? And if elected, what would your level of engagement be with these groups? Two minutes. I think that uh, community associations and resident associations are absolutely crucial because these are the individuals who are involved in the community, in touch with the community, who are the, have the greatest stake in the community. They are the people who are the most aware of the issues and concerns specifically with the communities. Uh, I, I definitely would um, maintain close contact with the, with the community associations. I would be certain to have representation at every community meeting, and, and there are a number of them. I'm enjoying attending these meetings here throughout the election to hear about concerns um, in specific communities uh, directed uh, directed uh, towards me as a candidate. Um, and you know, as well, in, in talking to people at doors as well, um, sometimes people have have questions for me which could probably be better uh, answered by their community associations. Um, for example, when I was at the uh, movie night at the Marquine de Lorne Community Association, um, I had an individual say to me, you know what, I'd really like to see a Zamboni. Uh, at our at our rink, and and I said, you know, uh, that's that's excellent. I think that this is a you know a fantastic resource. Sports are important for for our families. Recreational facilities are important for our families. I said, but maybe you could talk to your community association regarding that. Perhaps that's the best venue for you to go through uh, in an effort to to achieve that result to get that samboni. But I recognize them as being. Um, the, the roots of the community. These are absolutely the, the individuals who know the needs uh, and the requirements of the community. And I definitely uh, pledge to, as I said, have representation at every meeting um, in one regard or another and, and to carry out um, their wishes at, at, the, at the city level. But I, I believe strongly in these organizations. I have a lot of respect for the individuals who are within these organizations. Thank you. Shane? I think first you have to understand the difference between a residence association, RA, and a community association, a CA. A residence association is set up usually by the developer or a group of communities in the area that say we, we want to have extra. So they pay on to above and on their taxes a fee. And many of the communities in Ward 12 have them, and, and one does not, which is Copperfield. All of the others have an RA and a CA in component. CA is a community association which is nonprofit, all volunteer, with no funding uh, available other than the memberships that they sell to the individuals. So they, they have a little more difficult. And the, it's the changing face, you might say, because uh, in Ward 12, almost all of the RAs have exactly the same boundaries as the CAs. And the CAs have more difficulty now doing the things that the RAs are doing. At one time, the CAs were the pro recreation providers, the community hall, all of these hub of the community, they were the center. Now the RAs are, but the CAs still have that political connection to the city, where they advise the city on development, and they look at blueprints, and they look at permits, and they do all of these. So I've developed and working on two pilot projects within Ward 12, where the CA and the RA are working together. And it's not merging, but it's uh, let's saying, you know what, we have differences, we have ways of working within the community, but we need to make sure both are sustainable. And so the concept there is the RA, who has a very solid support base behind them and financial, are willing to help the CA stay afloat with the financial support. And then the city sets aside land to the CA, which sits idle until the CA has enough money to build on it. Now the RA could turn around and build on the city land, giving more facilities to the community, yet they, have, they can't do it without the CA's support. The CA has access to government grants, which the RA does not. 
So the two working together in tandem, making sure they're both sustainable is what we need for the future. And that's uh, the pilot project's going in in one, and it's also being talked about in the other, and that's what we need in Ward 12. Thank you. Another question for Shane first this time. Yeah. What will you do to provide amenities for suburbs like Seton? Well, I think we have to look at it, and, and we look at where we're going. Um, the question is, and I've seen it, I uh, hope we have a library in the next three years. Well, in one week, we're starting construction on the Quarry Park Rec Centre, which has a library incorporated in it. In 2015, we have a, uh, construction starting on the Seton Rec Centre, which is going to be there. That centre has ice rinks, uh, a wave pool, a swimming pool, water slides. All of these came about because we were willing to go forward and take... Uh, some tax room that was left by the, the government, and we had to do it at that time. We tried a P3, and that was declined. Uh, they don't uh, fund community rec centers, you might say. So we went forward and we did that, and then we did a borrowing bylaw to make sure that that was there. So that facility is going ahead. It's there. It's solid. The money is in place, and we're moving forward on that. Uh, I was part of that community representative board for two and a half years before I was elected. It is going forward. They've advised on what they would like to see. It is going to be one of the, the regional rec centers. Quarry Park is going forward. We're also going forward with Great Plains, which is also another twin arena. So we're getting the facilities finally in this area that they've deserved for so, uh, some time. And we know where we're going. So the other ones uh, we have to look at is how are we going to get better uh, facilities as far as outside of the recreation facilities. And that's the RA and the CA are working together to be able to, be able to build on more land and more facilities. We have to also look at what are the facilities that are specifically needed once these are done. The rec centers are going to have meeting rooms, child care, libraries, uh, fitness centers, running tracks, uh, and all of these in there. That's what the community hub is all about, and we go forward. We also have to make sure that there is enough population to make them sustainable. The city builds the facilities, and then they look for a nonprofit organization to run them so that it's efficient and it works well without wasting money and bureaucracy. Thank you. Uh, individuals I've talked to at the door. Yes, sorry, sorry, uh, Stephanie, is that sorry. one chip? Oh, excuse me. Did you? Oh, oh I'm so sorry. I thought it was my turn to. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yep. Yeah. My mistake. I started oh, with Shane. Carry okay. on. Oh, pardon. Start again. Oh, pardon. Sorry. That's fine. Two minutes. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, individuals I've talked to at the door um, are very concerned that uh, they will see no timeline of the recreational facilities. Uh, they are worried that the recreational facilities will go the way of the Southeast LRT. Individuals at the door tell me, you know, we were we were promised this uh, Southeast LRT. I should say, I shouldn't say we were told that this was at the top of the priority list at the last civic election, and it's moved to the bottom of the priority list. They're concerned that the same thing is going to happen with these recreational facilities. They say, oh, they'll start development of the recreational facilities, and then they'll they'll run over cost, and then you know, um, will will it be possible to have these facilities? So. Individuals really wonder if, if they are going to become a reality, if they are going to be finished in time for their school-aged children to enjoy. I, I'm definitely hearing that. Secondly, I'm, I'm hearing that um, the facilities uh, were not done with complete consultation exactly in regards to everything that residents of Ward 12 would like to see with the, within these facilities. One individual in Elgin in particular was on the planning committee and, and uh, quit in disappointment and in, in absolute frustration that, that indoor soccer was not brought into this, these facilities or a, a facility uh, specifically. And these facilities absolutely need to reflect the, the wants and the needs of or the, the desires of Ward 12, how they would like to spend their leisure time. Um, and finally, um, I, while I do believe in, in, uh, in facilities and amenities for residents, um, I find it very bold that Shane brought up that these facilities were in fact funded by a portion of the $52 million because in my consultation at the doors, there are many residents of Ward 12 who would have preferred to have those funds within their pocket. So I think it's very brave that he, that he mentions that. Thank you, Mac. Shane has cast a chip for one extra minute. Thank you. I, I think we have to look at the doom and gloom aspect sometimes and the saying is, is it going to happen? If you check the records, if you look at City Council, you will see the borrowing bylaws, you will see the money that's put aside, and it is not the $52 million that we're talking about. This goes back to 2011 when the province first left money on the table. We lost the P3 application. Council made the decision at that time to say, 
there was a problem with PCs. This is a desperate need. We have to move forward. They took the tax room. Shortly after that, someone brought in a motion to say, let's take it all whenever it happens. And I voted against that consistently, everything for the last two and a half years, because it's a wrong way to do it. When you have money left, you take a decision and you move forward and you say, is it the right decision at this time? You don't do it automatically. So the question is, one week from today, I suspect there will be construction on the Quarry Park uh, Rec Center. Two years from today, I suspect there will be construction on the Seton because the planning and the architect's drawing. Thank you. Another question from the audience. Lowering speeds to 30 kilometers an hour improves road safety for all users, especially children and seniors. How will you work to reduce vehicle speeds in residential areas? Stephanie. Thank you, Mac. Door knocking along the major boulevards of Ward 12, I can tell you that this is the number one concern of Ward 12 residents and that this is not being addressed adequately at present. I have had one mother tell me that she is going to start kicking balls into boulevards in an effort to make people to stop. I've had another mother tell me she's going to start pushing baby carriages in into boulevards in an effort to get people to stop. That's how desperate the residents of Ward 12 are in an effort to address this since it has not been addressed as of yet. Solutions I've talked with uh, two individuals at doors include more speed bumps. Uh, Douglas Dale, an example, uh, for example, I was told that a speed bump was put in, however, it was not adequate as a single speed bump. The speed bump was made larger. This too was not adequate and that further action is needed. Another solution I've discussed with individuals at the door also includes the signs uh, which post the speed that you're going at and that when people have awareness of the speed that they are going at, uh, perhaps this will force them to slow down. But this is definitely one of the major issues that I come across in consultation with Ward 12 residents and seemingly not has been done enough, enough done to address it. Thank you. Shane, two minutes. I think, we, I think we have to look at what we're talking about. Are we changing the speed limits in blanket across the city? Is it appropriate everywhere or is it not? We have to understand that the speed limit is 50 kilometers unless posted different. So that means we would have to go forward and post signs absolutely everywhere that says you can go this speed here or that speed there. So we have to look at it, but we have to look at what we're talking about. Rather than saying this is the way we're going and this is what should be done, does it make sense to do that in absolutely every scenario? Or do we look at each scenario and say this is what should be done here because that's the right choice? Speed bumps on major throwaways, uh, you cannot do. The fire department has said we will not allow it because they can't get their equipment over them. So which would you sooner have? Fire department getting to your house on time or equipment that doesn't work in the area? So we have to look at, is this the right scenario at this place? And just because someone wants something doesn't mean that it has to be or it doesn't mean it is the best solution. It's an idea. You take all ideas, you put them on the table, you sort them out and you find out which is the best solution for that scenario and you go forward. We have to also look at what we're doing to do traffic. Uh, Douglas Dale is the first one in the city to get a solar flashing light beside a school as a pilot project. That came about in the last while. We're doing traffic calming areas in many different areas and how we're looking at different scenarios and, and how we can move forward and what we can do in, in all of these areas. So it's not a simple solution. Do we need to do something? Without question. But we have to understand I and the city and the neighborhoods cannot control bad behavior. And the bad behavior of neighbors is something that we have to look at solidly as a community and what can we do about it. The speeding in Calgary is there. And I wish I could do something about everyone who speeds, but I can't. All I can do is say we need to enforce it as much as we can. We need to do whatever is the best solution at the right time for that scenario. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie has requested an extra minute. Well, as a former emergency planner for the Government of Canada, um, and I've talked to a number of uh, emergency responders at the doors uh, specifically, uh, primarily in regards to the uh, effect of the flooding in the Douglas substation. And I do have respect for the requirements in an effort to assist Ward 12 residents in times of trouble. I do know that parents are greatly concerned for their children's safety. And this is something that happens on a daily basis. 
children playing on front lawns, children playing um, in side streets, and speed is a big problem. So I think we definitely have to consider the, the, uh, the, the wishes of Ward 12 residents that their children are, needs are taken care of and that they are given a safe environment in which to be in. Secondly, while we cannot control behavior, we do have an obligation as elected representatives to put in rules, laws, and policies to Thanks. an attempt to enforce them. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Stephanie. I have a question. This one's going to Shane first this time. Uh, that reflects uh, another question that was popular in the user voice and it's received quite a bit of media attention. It's not Ward 12 specific, but I'm going to ask it from the generic wording. Um, will you commit to releasing a list of your campaign donors or donations before Election Day? The answer is yes. It'll be out by the end of the week. How can I answer any more than that? It's already on the blog. It's already on Jason Markosoff's uh, paper that I says I will do it. Uh, I told him I would, and it's in the process. All right. So, I mean, the question is so specific. I don't know how do you expand okay. on it. We'll have more time for more questions. <laughs> you know? Stephanie. You know, as I stand for transparency, absolutely yes. Uh, my only concern is that. Um, I guess the manner in which the lists are published. I think it's very easy for corporations and organizations to hide behind individuals. And I really hope that uh, the, the uh, uh, electoral um, forces that, which oversee this process will address that to ensure that there is absolute transparency. Thank you, Mac. Okay, another one from the, the audience. Everyday people using city streets to walk, shop, linger, and eat equals vibrant communities. How will you work to promote vibrant communities? Stephanie first, sorry. I, I think that vibrant communities are um, are a result of, of uh, the, their environments. And I think within their environments, they, they happen organically. Um, the reality is that uh, in Ward 12, we have a number of, of vibrant locations. I'm a very proud resident of, of Prestwick, and I spend a lot of my time in the evenings and on the weekends on High Street, um, whether I'm at the pizza joint or enjoying a, a sub. I, I think you create the environments uh, in an effort to have these, these, these vibrant locations, and, and the people will come. Uh, another example is, is the fountain in, in uh, Mackenzie Town. That's a lovely place uh, to go on the weekends. I, my husband and I, we t we've taken our son there throughout the summer, and it's just really beautiful to see him running through uh, the fountain, enjoying all the, the facilities there. Um, I feel we, we create these environments, and, and, and they, they happen organically. They, they happen through enjoying the environments uh, in, which, in which we have. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Shane? I think you have to also sit down and de define what vibrancy is. I mean, there's vibrancy where you have street cafes and you have the theaters and you have all of these. And we have those in Ward 12 and we're getting more and more without questions. There's vibrancy as far as going for a walk down a path. There's vibrancy as far as being able to talk to your neighbors on the, on the step and being able to, to meet in a local park. So the question is, what are we going to do? We have to develop more and more specific related uh, planning like High Street, for example, and, and my son owns a, a photography studio on High Street. It's a great place to go. It's a great place to work. But is that the only style? And sometimes when we get into the definitions and the talk, everyone thinks that vibrancy means that you have to have street cafes and I can walk here and I can walk there and I, and I can hear music and I do all that. It's a whole lot of things that makes a community vibrant. It isn't one style or one type. So then we look at, okay, where are we going to go with those? And the idea of development, if we look at Mahogany Bay, for example, there's MDP and there's Imagine Calgary, and all of these plans were drawn up after Mahogany Bay was planned. And Mahogany Bay has Community of the Year two years in a row, I believe, or two years in the last time. And it also understands that it meets all of the densification requirements of the MDP and Planet Calgary. So the planners and the developers 
know what needs to be done, what we have to do in many cases to get vibrant. I talked to a developer one time who said he wanted to put stamped concrete in an intersection and city planners said, no, you can't do that because you know we might have trouble. But the point is we have to get into the acceptance of something different than what we have, something new and something out of the box so that we're able to go forward and develop communities that are different, not all identical, but are different and make sure that the vibrancy is there for the residents who choose to live there. And they choose that because of that vibrancy. Thank you. Just to note, I've started the first question in round two with Stephanie and I'm just alternating, so it's not, you know, it's, not, it's as random as it gets, I guess, as fair as it gets. Here's another one from an audience member, not ward specific, but taxes affect us all. How do we stop the exponential increase in property taxes, which is unsustainable for all Cal Calgary families? This one goes to Shane first. If you look at my voting record, I voted against uh, the tax increases for the last year and a half. I voted for the first budget because we needed it to get our rec centers and we went forward from there. I've looked at it in one of my motions was the only motion in 2012 that actually reduced the uh, tax increase by $750,000 by looking at differences in with an administration. I had a question the other day at the doors that says, what do you define efficiency? Efficiency is not just reducing taxes. Efficiency and making sure that we're doing it properly is changing how we do things to make sure that the employees are working as efficient as possible, to make sure that the number of employers are there, looks at uh, la um, a land and asset strategy. Are we using the buildings as best we can? Are the buildings worth more than to sell them and move on? Is the land worth more? So if we're gonna talk about taxes, let's talk about all of the scenarios in which way we can make sure that we're doing exactly what it is. It isn't an increase or a decrease in taxes. Uh, we also have to look at the history in Calgary. There was a history in Calgary where nothing was done for a long time and tax rates stayed fairly even or even stayed at zero. But now we're paying for that because the infrastructure isn't there and we have to move forward continually. I've uh, led a charge to make sure that, and there's an audit going now for the land and asset strategy that says, we need to look at every building, every piece of land that we own and should we keep it or should it be sold? There was a prime example, a library was closed, it was used for book storage. It was in a very residential area. That land, that property should have been sold at that time, put up a multifamily complex on it. We didn't have to maintain it on that cost. Uh, we didn't gain any taxes. If it was sold, we would have had taxes and no maintenance. So the efficiency of it is what we're talking about and making sure that the taxes are as low as possible is by changing how we do things and making sure that our city is run efficiently. I've coined the, the phrase that city of Calgary should operate like a business but behave like a service industry and that's what we have to do. Thank you. Stephanie? Well, in door knocking, I can tell you that this is one of the top three issues on the minds of uh, Ward 12 residents. And it's no wonder uh, that Shane received a resounding endorsement from Mayor Nenshi, because despite the fact that he voted uh, against these budgets, he has done nothing in an effort to collaborate and convince the other members of council um, to, to stop them, to put, in, to put an end to the creep. It's 30% in the last three years, 13.1% this year alone, up six out of the last seven years with the exception of 2007 when inflation is only 1.4%. This is unacceptable. Having said that, I am also hearing at the doors that residents of Ward 12 do not mind paying their taxes if they can see the programs and services delivered. But the problem is they are not always seeing the programs and services delivered. For example, the Southeast LRT. They wonder, when will that come? Will this ever come? 35 years is not an acceptable time frame. I propose doing two things. First of all, an evaluation of existing services. There are some services which are being provided, which Ward 12 residents have told me that they in fact do not want, and expenditures which have occurred, which they did not support, for example, the Peace Bridge. In addition, I believe that it's very important that we evaluate all services to make sure they are being delivered as efficiently as possible. And I, as a former management consular officer for the federal government, have great experience in doing this with operational budgets down consistently over the last three years and recently having been nominated 
for a Deputy Minister's Award at Foreign Affairs Canada for my ability of measuring metrics and measuring and having delivered good efficiencies in systems and processes. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Uh, I got a chip. Oh, oh, sorry, Shane, you put another chip in. One minute. So let's look at stats because stats are a very interesting thing. You can use them however you want. So have your taxes actually gone up on a base without an increase in value of your house 30%? The answer, the answer is absolutely not. What has happened in the past three years, and I, and I admit and I voted against it, what has happened is 50% typically of your taxes goes to the province, 50% goes to the city. When you pay your taxes, that's exactly what happens. Now, the 50 isn't exactly right. It's slightly skewed now, but at one time it used to be 50. So what's happened is the province has asked for less money. The city council and those who want to make sure that we pay as much tax as we have, have always taken that tax room. So your taxes, your base has not risen, but your proportion to the city has risen. And I've fought that and I've got against it. So collaboration is a question that's been here. I had five issues on the last council member. Four of them passed, three of them unanimously, one at a 13 to one. So my collaboration on council is extremely well. Okay, next question. I am going to add a little bit to it. Um, but it says, Calgarians have said they're concerned about safety on LRTs and other public spaces after 6 p.m. What will you do to help address that? Stephanie first. I can repeat the question if you like. Sure. Calgarians have said they're concerned about safety on LRTs and other public spaces. What will you do to help address that? Well, this is an issue that has been brought to my attention when I've been door knocking in Ward 12, um, specifically for individuals who live close to parks. Uh, they are concerned after hours about um, people who are within the parks, um, in addition to um, teenagers, young adults, um, they do worry about the activity going on there at that time. Uh, in addition, in Douglasdale, uh, it was brought to my attention that there has been uh, a large amount of vandalism there uh, very recently, and uh, residents there are concerned about that. This issue also came to my attention when I was door knocking in Auburn Bay. Uh, people mentioned a number of break-ins uh, and also recently uh, a, a murder. So security and safety is definitely on the, the minds of Ward 12 residents. Um, I think that adequate policing is absolutely necessary uh, in an effort to make sure that uh, individuals feel safe in their communities. That's what we all want is to feel safe in, in our homes. I know uh, I want to feel safe in my home. I want to know that my family is, is, uh, is, is safe within our home and I think we need adequate policing um, in an effort to do this. Uh, but also overseas, I served as the security manager for both um, an embassy as well as a consulate, and uh, we evaluated a, a, a frequently, out, out of necessity, a number of other security options, uh, including um, closed circuit television systems, um, guards as, as necessary. So I think we need to, to evaluate other options for security solutions so that residents of Ward 12 can feel safe in their community. Thank you. Thank you. Jane? Well, I think we have to look at, first of all, what we're really talking about in many cases. Uh, crime rate and down in Calgary, extremely well. We just signed Chief Hansen, uh, probably the most popular and the best chief uh, of a police in the country. And as I sit on the police commission, we hear about all of the programs that are there. There are numerous programs out there which are preventative medicine. They are not saying, let's catch the guys and, and deal with them. It's how can we stop them from doing it in the first place. And Calgary leads the way for that. They go into the schools. They have programs off, off uh, outside of the schools. They go up into the communities. The, um, Police officer comes to every CA meeting, gives a report, and talks about how we can make sure that these things are done. So the key is, as many ways, is how are we going to stop it before it starts? So then let's look at red light cameras. I've heard a lot of people saying it's a cash grab. Well, it's not. If you're speeding, you're going through a red light, that's your problem. Don't do it, and we don't have the problems. 
Cameras are a great way. Put them on all LRT stations. I have no problem with so-called Big Brother. If you're there and something happens, they've got a record. So let's go forward. Let's put in the stuff that we need. Police officers are now using body cameras so that they have evidence of what goes on. In the parks, let's look at lighting. Let's look at forward. Let's look at programs. Uh, we also just gave money away to uh, the Federation of Calgary Communities, which can implement the Block Watch program, which was failing because of, again, too many volunteer organized has differences. So let's look at what programs can be put out there. Let's look at specific programs and specific action plans to make sure that the crime is where it should be. How can we move forward? Um, the other one is the uh, efficiency of, of our people that we have in place. Do we need a highly trained, skilled, highly paid, to some degree, if you want to call it that, police officer on a C train? No, we can have people in uniform. The presence of that is what deters crime. It's also the way we look at it and being as efficient as possible. Let's train people who can do these jobs, uh, but don't have to carry a gun. Let's look at ways to make sure that we're doing it properly. Thank you. I'm going to ask the eighth question from uh, for this section and then switch it up to the how round. The last, uh, this eighth question goes to Shane first. Um, a top, topical question. Uh, Ward 12 has a long stretch of Bow River running along one edge of it. If elected or re-elected, how will you repair flood damage public infrastructure and strengthen Calgary's flood mitigation policies? We have to look, and then, and then we raised the issue of the, the last $52 million that the province left on the table. We made a decision to dedicate that specifically to flood relief. We had to do it. It was a disaster. It came. We had to take the pinch and move forward. Are we going to do it again? Um, we don't know until November. Uh, the council wanted to say, let's do it in 2013 and 2014, and then we'll find how to spend the other $52 million. I had an amendment to the motion that said, no, why are we doing this? We don't know what the cost of insurance, we don't know what the province is paying, we don't know all these specifics. So let's go forward and say, dedicate 2013s, let's go forward and look at 14, and that's coming at budget time when we have solid ideas. We just got a check for 62 million from the province. We're also told that the province is gonna cover some overtime, so we have to look at those. Is that an efficient way to use that 52 million? It may be. But let's not jump to the gun and say dismiss it and let's say this is the wrong way to go. It might be what we need. So we need a flood mitigation. Is that a way to use the 52 million? I don't know. I voted against keeping it the first time because it was the wrong way to do it. The process was incorrect. But in a case of an emergency, you go to your savings. We have the reserve fund. We have over $250 million set aside in the sustainability reserve fund. Why can we not tap into that, finish it, some of the drainage issues, finish some of the, the blocking or the decking that we need to do? We also have to understand where we're at. We had 96 kilometers of pathways wrecked along the Bow River. We've repaired well over half of those. We're moving forward in an efficient manner. It's going to take time without question. You can't fix everything because if you speed into the fact we're going to fix this bridge today, you're doing sole sourcing and you're doing high prices. We've got to make sure that we're doing it as best we can and as efficiently as possible. And the only way to do that is fix it piece by piece and then we get it done and make sure the funding is in place so that we can do it properly. Thank you. Stephanie? Well, while I'm door knocking, I definitely talk to a number of residents that would like to see uh, the pathways repaired as, as soon as possible. They feel that they are missing out on considerable recreational activity, as well as many individuals have remarked to me that um, their, their normal method of commuting to work has been impacted. Um, but more important to me, as, a, as an emergency planner for the federal government of Canada, uh, I did a lot of work on this. I specifically designed preparation and mitigation plans. I did this for uh, evacuating Canadian residents in El Salvador, and I did it specifically uh, as the former consul to, to Texas, where I also had responsibility for Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and most relevant to this answer, Louisiana. So I have been trained um, in terms of the design and preparation of these, prep, uh, of these plans. Um, I have attended uh, hurricane conferences where I have learned um, specific um, methods in an effort to address uh, these things. And I feel I have a lot to offer uh, in terms of skills 
moving forward on this issue. When I was determining um, my platform, the issues most important uh, to, to this campaign and to the residents of Ward 12, flood relief was definitely on my mind, specifically uh, Douglas, the Douglas substation. Uh, and I actually had some of my advisors say, well, perhaps this isn't relevant, it won't be mentioned. Uh, but as I mentioned previously, I have had two emergency planners at the door bring it to my attention. So this, this indicates to me that um, my experience uh, and my skills are right on in regards to this. So I definitely would like to contribute in this capacity in regards to the river. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And now I'm going to switch to the how round a little bit. If uh, everybody familiar with that, um, I will randomly select who goes first. Stephanie, from your from your website, you have uh, committed to working together to get results. And part of that says, as a, pro a proven consensus builder. You're going to work with all city councillors, the mayor, and community stakeholders to deliver results for the residents of Ward 12 and for the betterment of our great city. The question is, how are you going to advocate for Ward 12 versus how are you going to balance Ward 12 interests with citywide interests? Sure, I think the collaboration is very important on two regards. Uh, first of all, in regards to collaboration with the other members of city council. We must remember that Ward 12 is only one vote. South Calgary is only three votes. This means that we must absolutely collaborate with both the center and the north, uh, the representatives from there. A collaboration to me not only means saying as a representative, we want this, we need this. True collaboration is asking other city council members, what do you need in your ward? What is required in your ward? How can we work together for alternative solutions? This is something that I've had great success with in the past with, is not only acting as a representative, but collaborating in a productive manner to achieve results. Secondly, I think it's very important to collaborate with other levels of government, uh, both the provincial and the federal. And I think that this is something that will be required for many projects here. Thank you. Thank you. And Shane, another minute for you. On your website, you, uh, you promised that over the next four years, you will be an agent for change in council by pushing the city to consistently be open and transparent. How will you do that? Well, I think we looked at another. As chair of the governance committee, we've looked at ways of moving forward and changing our own bylaw procedures. So we started with us first. We said we have to change how we're doing things. Less uh, in-camera time, less all of these other things that we can work on to make sure that we're as open and as transparent. The other issue is we have to make sure that we're, do, we're doing exactly what we're saying and budgets are out there. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a call in many cases to put the uh, administrator's salary and they do it in other municipalities. I have no problem with that. Uh, when I was in my previous job, everyone knew what I made. So why shouldn't we do that in this case? If you're a public agent, you should be out there in the public. Transparency means that reports are easy to read, go forward, they're accessible and they're out in front of everyone so that they've got the chance to read them. Making sure that we're changing how, and we just passed how to do elections. We looked at a number of different methods in which we should do our elections, how we should fund them, how we should report, and we go from there. Transparency is doing it and moving forward. Thank you. We have 10 minutes left before the nine o'clock deadline. We have candidate summaries to do, and I noticed that uh, there are still some chips left uncashed. If, uh, in the absence of more specific questions, would you like to spend your chips right now on a topic of your choice? <laughs> or, I mean, the, op the alternative is to go for your candidate summaries of two minutes each and sum it up. I'm fine with that, and if there's a question after, we're okay. Yeah. Okay, and in the interest of randomness, two minutes goes to Stephanie again. This is, these are not random tips. <laughs> <laughs> One's That's heavier okay. than the other. <laughs> I've got broad shoulders. I can take the heat. Uh, 
Well, I, you know, I want to thank everyone again for coming out this evening. Um, as I said, I recognize um, from talking to people at the doors and, and seeing their lives, people have such busy lives in this day and age, and so I really appreciate everyone uh, making the effort to be here this evening. I want to thank Civic um, Forum again for, for uh, placing or organizing this event. I think it's, it's just fantastic that individuals can have the opportunity to meet candidates. I want to thank uh, Cardell again for having us here at this facility, and I'd like to thank Shane for being here as well. But most importantly, thank you so much to all of you. So tonight we've had the opportunity to discuss ideas. But again, as I stated previously, ideas are meaningless without results. Without that, they are just ideas. And I believe that Ward 12 deserves better results. I have been told this repeatedly at the door that people are not satisfied in having their C train in, a, in, the, in the existing time frame. And this is what I, I, I believe I have the, the skills and the experience uh, to do this, both through my, my experience in collaboration to achieve results and my experience uh, at the federal government, with the federal government in an, an effort to, to achieve these results. And I really would like to do that, uh, have the opportunity to do that for, for Ward 12, because right now we're not seeing results. We're seeing a, a lot of talking and a lot of planning, a lot of ideas, but no results. And that is why I've put my name forward as a candidate for Ward 12, because I feel that Ward 12 deserves results. So thank you very much to everyone for your ideas out there. Um, I am absolutely um, encouraged and motivated by, by the will and the spirit of people at War 12 that, that I meet at the doors. I, I look forward to meeting more of you. Thank you. Shane? Well, let's talk about the most vital component in Ward 12, which is transportation. Let's talk about the fact that there are no results. And of course, you can look forever, and if you don't want to find the results, you'll never see them there. But they are, the list goes on and on about traffic lights, calming, making sure that we got the rec centers, an awful lot. So let's talk about funding for the LRT, and let's talk about what place it's in. Let's talk about what I can do. There is now $115 million set aside in this phase two green trip, which is part of vesting mobility. It says that 115 of the next application goes straight to the, green, to the LRT. We have now $12 million being spent on the final engineering and designing of the LRT. We have $2 million being spent on um, transit-oriented development of the LRT. And the potential for that is huge, and that's going to skew the complete rules of how we evaluate what is the LRT and what it's going to use. So that's being done presently. Those are results for the most vital component within Ward 12. We also have to look at where we're going and what the plan is. We can always have motherhood and apple pie statements and doom and gloom, but what is a plan? I've identified, I brought a notice, a notice of motion to council for us to sit outside, think of out of the box uh, thinking. I identified seven solid ways to fund the LRT. The, the most valuable one is boot. Build, own, operate, and transfer it. You get a consortium, they come in and they build it, they own it, they operate it, in 25 years or so they transfer it to the city. It's done in Asia, it's done in the Americas, it's done in Europe, and it's done solidly, and that's where we have to go with us. We can look at the Calgary Municipal Corporation, which build East Village. They can build the LRT from 2nd Avenue to the east side of the river. They can do that because they have the funds. We have to look at a community revitalization levy, which allows tax base to go directly to building that. We can look at provincial grants. We can look at P3 and Building Canada. We can look at the City of Calgary. I've identified that workshop is going home next month, and we will continue in that manner. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, audience members, for your engagement, and candidates for your forthcoming and candor. And thanks to the Civic Camp and our sponsors and the citizens who provided most of these questions for tonight. Um, I just would like to thank everybody before we go and remember that, um, remind you that Civic Camp is also hosting councillor forums in every other ward. This is the first one we've done, so there's going to be a, uh, 
a forum in every ward. And if you know people that live in other places, get them to come out and hear what their, their nominees are, are going to be talking about. And don't forget to vote. Most important message to take home today is vote on October 21st. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.